Hi, this is Tim from Morial TV and Morial Radio here live via Skype with James Jacob Prash. Jacob, this is glad you asked. Question number three, Valerie asked, uh, based on Ephesians 4.11, is the fivefold ministry still active today? And if not, has the roles changed? And why did the roles change? Well, thank you so much for your question, Valerie. It is a very intelligent question and a necessary one that many Christians have been and are being confused by. So thank you for asking it, first of all. Let's look now and understand something. In the original Greek text, it is linguistically and technically a fourfold ministry because the ministry of a pastor and the ministry of a teacher are linked. Let's begin there. One may be a teacher without necessarily being a pastor, but a pastor must be able to expound doctrine. That doesn't mean they're an expositor. That doesn't mean they're a theologian or a Greek scholar or a Hebrew scholar, but it does mean they have to be able to rightly divide the word of God. There are three essential kinds of preaching in the New Testament or or, or pre or presenting of God's word in the New Testament. Three. The first is called kerygma, kerygma, charismatic preaching. That is what evangelists do. It's preaching the gospel to the unsaved. The second is what we're doing now, didaskin, didaskin. We get the word didactic, didaskin. It is expounding and explaining doctrine and how to apply it. Didaskin. The third is what pastors have to be able to do, homilia, homilia. We get the word homily. They have to be able to take that doctrine and use it to encourage, sometimes correct, certainly to guide the sheep of their congregation, of the flock that the Lord's entrusted them with. So a pastor will focus more on homilia. A teacher will focus more on didaskin, and an evangelist will focus more on kerygma. Now, they can certainly overlap, but that's part of the background. Now, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Apostles. Much confusion surrounds the term apostle and the way it's used and misused. There are different categories of apostles in the New Testament, the most unique being in Hebrews 4, the Lord Jesus himself. He occurs with the definite article, ho apostolo, the apostle. All apostolic authority derives from him. Then we have the next category of apostle, the ones who saw the Lord. Some of them had been, as it were, in a preparatory academy with John the Baptist, even before that, we speak here of the 12 apostles and then, of course, of, of, of Paul. Paul saw the Lord and he was taught directly by the Lord, the same as Peter, James, and John were, according to 2 Corinthians. He was somehow transfigured, raptured, whatever, he didn't understand it, and taken to heaven. And he communed with the Lord in Arabia for eight years. But when he wrote of the Lord's Supper, he said, I received from the Lord that which I delivered unto you. Notice how Paul writes about the Lord's Supper as if he were present. I got this directly from Jesus. He didn't get it from the other apostles who were present, and he was not physically present. So we can put Paul in the same category with Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Matthew, Simon, Bartholomew, Jude, Matthias. Okay, James, the other James, and so forth. Those apostles no longer exist. John was the last at the end of the first century when he wrote the book of Revelation as a closed canon. There's no more apostles like that. That kind of apostolic authority still exists in the writing of the apostles. What apostolic authority means is the authority that Jesus gave the 12 apostles to explain the rest of scripture. Jesus told them when the Holy Spirit comes, 
he will remind you of all I have taught you. We read the rest of Scripture, as I've said various times, through the prism of the apostles' teaching, that is, the epistles. Think of the epistles as the lenses through which we read the rest of Scripture. If you want to know what Jesus meant, we begin by looking at what the apostles say he meant in the epistles. There are different kinds of literary genre in Scripture. We have Hebrew poetry. We have apocalyptic. We have narrative. We have history. However, we also have letters. Think of the epistles as inspired commentary. The Holy Spirit inspired the epistles to be written by the apostles to explain the rest of Scripture and primarily to explain what Jesus meant. We don't take Jesus' words in isolation from what the apostles say they meant. Let's understand. If you want to understand what the gospel is, read Romans. If you want to understand what the gospel is not, read Galatians. If you want to understand what Jesus meant in the Olivet Discourse, read First and Second Thessalonians. If you want to understand how Jesus fulfilled the Levitical typology of the high priest and the sacrifices uh, on the Day of Atonement and so forth, read Hebrews. The epistles explain the rest of Scripture. That was the unique authority that the Twelve Apostles had. The only place that apostolic authority still exists is in what the apostles were inspired to write by the Holy Spirit the same as the Hebrew prophets wrote the Old Testament, the Tanakh. But then there's another category, technically there's more than this, but there's three basic ones. Church planting missionaries, apostolo, one who was sent. Now remember Jesus told the man to go wash in the pool of Siloam? That's well excavated now, about 80 or 85 percent of it is excavated. We know exactly where it was. You can stand on the very steps, and you can see the stairway leading up to the Temple Mount where the procession in John 8, what we call Simcha Bet Shoiva, would have happened. The archaeological verification of the accuracy of the Gospels prove it was written by Jews in the first century. There can be no other explanation. It's just too accurate. And there's more and more archaeological evidence all the time, particularly in and around Jerusalem, but not only in Jerusalem. Well, let's understand this now. The Pool of Siloam comes from the word shaliach, the one who was sent. The Hebrew word for apostle is shaliach, one who was sent. The Greek word apostolo merely translates into Greek, apo, the prefix, outside of, apostolo, the one who goes outside, the one who was sent out. Now, these are church planting missionaries. The model for this is found in Acts 13, initially. The Holy Spirit said, set out for me Barnabas and Saul. Notice pairs. It was never autocratic. It was never a one-man show, or I'm the apostle. The Holy Spirit ordained for both of them to be sent out. And they had to report back to the church in Antioch that did send them out. They were accountable. And when there was a major doctrinal issue, the circumcision of Gentiles and the place of the law for, for, for believers, particularly non-Jews, there was a council in Jerusalem in Acts 15, and all the apostles were there, and James, not Peter, James presided. The apostles were accountable. This is the only category of apostle we have today church planting missionaries, but it's not a one-man show, they're mission teams. They're sent out by one church to plant another, and they're held accountable, they report back. That still exists. But that's not about defining doctrine. It's about establishing a doctrinal foundation for the church they plant, but it's not the apostolic authority held by Peter, James, John, Paul, and so forth. 
Be careful of anybody who claims to be an apostle today. What do they mean? It's a loaded and a generally dangerous term. Today, the big deception, the big lie that the devil's propagating in the church is what we see with people like Bill Johnson, Mike Bickle, and others. The new apostolic reformation, a big lie of the devil. These are false apostles. It's what Jesus told the church in Ephesus. You do not tolerate these false apostles, but found them to be false. Well, they are false. What they are calling apostolic authority is often nothing more than heavy shepherding. It's a one-man show. It's autocratic leadership. It's monoepiscopacy on steroids. That's what it is. Don't believe it. So, do they exist? Apostles? Yes, church planting missionaries exist. Do prophets exist? There are people in the body of Christ through whom God speaks prophetically, but not to establish doctrine. Anything they say will have to be tested by the doctrine already recorded in Scripture. And if it is predictive and time-specific and it fails to happen, they are false prophets. They need to repent and they be, need to be never allowed to exercise prophetic ministry again. This is the case of John Wimber's Kansas City False Prophets with Mike Bickle, Paul Kane, the alcoholic and homosexual, and the womanizer Bob Jones and these people who were promoted by the Vineyard Movement, and the Restoration Movement in England, people like Gerald Coates, Terry Virgo, Roger Foster, who went along with this, this nonsense. These things are false. There are no apostles in that sense. The Restoration Movement in England in the 1980s was false. The New Apostolic Reformation is false, but so too are their prophetic ministries. You have people who predict things that don't happen. Michael Brown. Michael Brown is a proven false prophet. A proven false prophet. Ask him about his prophecies about the nationally destructive disastrous forest fires in 1987 in, in Israel and his prediction of a second day of Pentecost going to happen at a conference in Jerusalem, and nothing happened. He's a proven false prophet, a proven false prophet. Obviously, the Kansas City false prophets. There was one crazy, I don't know if it's clinically crazy, but Cindy Jacobs. I remember when she came to Zimbabwe in the days of Mugabe, who was a demon-possessed tyrant, and she prophesied how... Zimbabwe was going to be blessed and blossom. The diametric opposite happened. The nation was pushed to the brink of starvation and genocide. She's a proven false prophetess. Kenneth Copeland, Benny Hinn, these are proven false prophets. We are warned in Deuteronomy, if people predict things in Deuteronomy 18 that don't happen, get away from them. And Jesus said that their numbers would be propagated in the last days. And they're here. People who follow Benny Hinn or Kenneth Copeland or the, or the Kansas City false prophets, they're in rebellion against Jesus. They may be doing it in ignorance, but it's rebellion if they continue doing it. Now, there are people who, through whom I believe God has spoken prophetically. I don't see, say that they're perfect, but I've known people through whom God has indeed spoken prophetically. Someone I, I knew, but not well, although I was friends with his son, Gary, was David Wilkerson. He wrote a book called The Vision in the 1970s, and it all happened. It all happened. Now, I usually agreed with David Wilkerson, usually. There was a few points I did not. But I do think, although he never claimed to be a prophet, he only claimed to be a watchman, the Lord did at times speak through him prophetically and accurately. There was other people as well. I'm just naming him because he's a, he's a known figure. So yes, we can have prophets, but they don't write scripture like Isaiah or Jeremiah or Amos. We have apostles. Yes, we have church planting missionaries, but we don't have apostles like Peter or Paul or James. Evangelists, certainly we have evangelists. Not every Christian is an evangelist, but every Christian is a witness. We can't all speak to large groups of people and see decisions, 
but we can all witness one-on-one, -on -one, give our testimony, hand somebody a tract, share our faith. In other words, we don't all cast nets, but we can all fish with a rod and make you fishers of men. Every Christian should be involved in evangelism, but evangelists have a gift above that. Yes, there are evangelists. There are Bible teachers. There are expositors and theologians who have the gift of teaching, and there certainly are pastors. But if somebody is a pastor, he will be doctrinally correct in, in his sermons. And if there is a prophet, anything he says will be scripturally based, scripturally examinable. For instance, we've warned many times that the fruit of the Spirit is self-control, ikrete in Greek, and it says that twice in the New Testament. When you saw somebody on the ground having convulsions or being crazy, in the scripture, that was demon possession. When Jesus was casting the demon out of that boy who, whose father brought the, his son to Jesus, and he was on the ground and Jesus told the demon to come out of him. These things happen at Rodney Howard Brown meetings, and they're telling people it's the Holy Spirit. This is insane. This is insane. At one time, they would have been casting the demons out of them. Now they're saying it's the Spirit. When people are out of control, if somebody is not in control of themselves, the Holy Spirit's not in control of them. This madness and craziness, that is not how prophetic ministry works. We need to go here and take this part of our city, and it's never been taken before. So she's really called outside the walls of the church, and I see that God's going to take you to lots of people who are New Agers, you know, into the whole psychic thing that don't understand. But you're going to be, you're going to be a represent. Look at us go here. We're like twins. <laughs> you're going to be a representative of the truth. I've chosen you because of your background. Because of your background. Because of your background. To release my nature when you release my gifts. To become a living epistle. Like the word that became flesh and people saw the glory of God. And I will use you to father a movement that operates in such revival power, but it is coming out of the very nature and heart of God. I want my sister right here. Lift your hands up right over your head. It's like a lightning rod. Right over your head. It's like a lightning rod. Everyone stretch your hands out towards her. Thank you, Father. It's like the lightning of God is going to hit you now. It's like the lightning of God is being released right now. Lord, I release the lightnings of God over her life right now. So the key is not to, de to is not to define or not to discern, discern the form, but the key is to discern the brick. Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? Who are you in God? It comes from God, and to God it shall return, and it shall surround His presence. Forever and ever and ever and ever and ever in heaven. Who are you? Whenever you discern the form, without discerning the self, you will have a temporary structure that will not last. But whenever you discern the stone, aha! Aha! I see that stone! I know that stone! That's an apostolic, apostolic stone! That's a prophet stone! That's a healing stone! And you begin to let the old stone go with the young stone! The male stone!
go side by side with the female soul. Go to action. It's coming again. It's coming again. And when you discern the stone correctly, you can build a multiplicity of containers that contain life, that are life, that hold life, that hold the living, flowing. I hope this answers the question. The answer is yes, but it's a qualified yes, and we have to be careful, particularly in light of the deception going on today with so many false prophets and false apostles and the new apostolic reformation and things of this nature. Thank you so much for your question, Valerie. God bless. Thank you, Jacob.